Exciting parshas. <laughs> We're working on uh, volume two, hopefully, to come out before before Vayikra this year. We're working on uh, to have the second volume of the Sefer out. Yo, Zerat Hashem. But even just the what was on the original OU.org, when I learned with my boys for their bar mitzvah in a long time ago, we you were our beginning, and and uh, we so appreciated it, and that was 2011. <laughs> wow. Amazing, amazing. So since that we go then, I've been... Anyway, thank you for all you do. Amazing. It's uh, it's wonderful to be able to share uh, as close to in-person as we can. I think yeah. the first time... Uh, I'm going to wait till we officially start. I was in Stanford, uh, I don't know, about 20 plus years ago. I remember I was there on the shul there. I don't remember if anybody was there when I spoke there. I was, um, yes. I spoke about Kiddush and Abdullah, I think. Cover Kiddush, I think. It was an Eruv night. It was, you know, that's yeah. right, Eruv. Yeah. Hmm? So, it was an Arab night. I had booked you, Rabbi Weisner. It's Michael Feldstein. And, uh, yes, Michael. Michael, yes. So you definitely... Uh, yes, you I, definitely. Int I introduced you to the community, and uh, we, a lot of, you have a lot of fans here now. Baruch Hashem. Okay, and then I think amazing. You were, here, you were here once again for one <laughs> evening. I forget what, when, but uh, I, yeah. I know you were here twice. Yeah, and I, I hope after all this is over, we hope, as Rath Hashem, that we'll be able to uh, to share in person again. Mm -hmm. Good. My son Daniel was in your shear also. I yes, think Daniel him. was in my shear. How's he doing? In Thanks YU. Not. That was a number Rath of years Hashem. ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. He was spoke? in the shear when I spoke in when I spoke that time for the A. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. You Hold spoke. Yom Tov was the home team for Hashem, and Shabbos was the home team for Kla Yisrael. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. You remember the punchline of the year. I have to be careful about what I say today, what people are going to tell me in 20 years. Yeah. Okay. okay. Rabbi Cohen. Okay. Um, well, it seems we already know each other, which is good. Um, I want to uh, thank um, everyone for coming this morning. Uh, thank you to Daniel Shilowitz, our adult education chair, for helping um, not only lead this program, but for your stellar leadership um, of creating more Torah opportunities in the community. I want to acknowledge uh, Toby's presence, uh, who's an inspiration for a lot of the Torah as well, um, as president of the show, Michael Feldstein, who laid many foundations uh, for this. And thank you, Rabbi Kurtz, for logistically and being a wonderful partner in helping spread Torah. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity, really an annual event that we've had for many years now, the uh, pre Hanukkah, on Hanukkah, a Yom Iyun. And uh, I want to thank Rabbi Rosner. There have been many connections to our community. Uh, your Torah really has uh, spread throughout the world. But as people have shared, particularly in Stanford, I believe on one of our malt trips, we also had a chance to learn with you too. And uh, it's just an honor to um, have you here today. Wish you much Hatzlachah to you and your family. And I just want to turn it over to Sam Sroka, who is a devoted Talmud. Who's going to share a brief word of introduction before you speak. All right, we're very happy to have Rav Rosner here. So just a brief introduction before we get going. Uh, Rav Rosner is a Musmach of Ritz uh, and uh, was a popular Magid Shir in YU's Stone-Based Medrash program, where I learned under him, uh, and Rabbi of Congregation Base of Fry Mitzchak in Woodmere, New York, before making Aliyah in 2008. Currently, Rav Rosner serves as Rav Akilas Nofei Hashemesh and uh, is a Ram, uh, Rosh Masifta, at uh, Yeshivas Karim Yavne, KBY. Rav Rosner also is a, is a flagship Magid Shir for the OU's Aldaf Initiative, and his Shirim on Daf Yomi, Daf Be'iun, and Lumdus on the Daf can be found on the Aldaf app. Um, I personally come away with a wealth of new insight and understanding each time I listen to Rav Rosner's Shirim. Um, we'd like to welcome Rav Rosner virtually to Stanford. He'll be speaking for 30, 35 minutes after which we'll have a little time for, for questions. And without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Rav Shalom Rosner. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, Rabbi Cohn, Rabbi Kurtz. Thank you for all of the, uh, those who, uh, who arranged. And just before we begin, just one thing I, I like to say in, um, in some of my, uh, in the very shirim that, uh, that, uh, that I've been giving over the past couple of weeks, Rav Nevenzal has an amazing thought that there's something that we do all the time, but we never really thought about it. We lay in every Shabbos Mincha, we lay in a little bit of the following week's Parsha, right? Just the beginning, just the first Aliyah. What do we do that for? You know, this is this week and next week will be next week. Well, we have to get a little taste, a little taste of next week. It gets us excited. It's by Yishlach. We get a little bit of a Yeshev. 
So Rav Nevenzal says that this goes back, way back to Ezra HaSofer. Why do we do it? A Jew always knows there's next week's Parsha. A Jew always knows it's not just today. There's a future. There's a tomorrow. There's a next week's Parsha. You're in Vayeshev. No, there's a Miketz. You're in Miketz, Vayigash. No, we're all been, been challenged over the past nine months or so in all various ways, financially, socially, economic, whatever it is, family. But we have to know there's a next week's Parsha. And sometime soon, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to be able to learn together in person, preferably here in Israel. If not, we'll have to do it in Stanford. But it's, uh, it's really something that uh, we always have to keep in mind is always next week's Parsha. And that's what Rabbi Nevenzal reminds us. Okay, so now let's get into a little bit what we're going to talk about relating to uh, Hanukkah um, itself. And I hope most of the sources came through. Um, so what did you say? How long do I have here? About a half of 40 minutes or so? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. should be fine. As good or so? Okay, so we'll be finished by about, uh, about 5 p.m. my time, about 10, 10 a.m. Uh, your time. On the third day of Hanukkah, 1997, a couple of decades ago, 19-year-old Israeli soldier Menachem El and his buddy Donnie were stationed at a military outpost in the northernmost tip of the Lebanese security zone. Menachem, a religious Jew, was carrying the pocket of his battle vest, a laminated card. His father had typed out in the Hebrew part of the verse of the Torah, Hashem hu elokim ein od milvado. He gave his son the quote when Menachem went off to war with the admonition to say the Pasuk whenever he felt his life was in danger. Menachem Dadi were being shot at by Hezbollah terrorists positioned on a nearby mountain above them. Suddenly, Menachem saw an anti-tank missile hurtling directly towards him. Such missiles are two meters long and carry about six kilo of warhead, sufficient to easily penetrate a tank or the concrete outpost where Menachem was standing. Menachem thought, for sure, that's it. He quickly recited the Pasuk, Hashem hu elokim, Hashem is our God, Eino milvado, there is nothing besides him. Whatever Hashem wants will happen. If he doesn't want it to happen, it won't. Suddenly, a few meters in front of Menachem, the missile changed direction in midair as if it had struck an invisible force field. In full view of Menachem and eight other soldiers stationed on adjoining hilltops, the missile veered upwards against gravity and flew 20 meters straight up, then made an arc over Menachem's head and landed behind the outpost. The force of the explosion knocked Menachem and Dani off their feet but the only injuries they sustained were shrapnel on the back of their knees. When the battle was over, the platoon had a debriefing. The eight soldiers, including a few top officers who had witnessed the missile's astonishing trajectory, were at a loss to explain what had happened. In their entirely military career, they had never seen a missile behave like this. Their unanimous appraisal was that it was a miracle. It was a miracle that happened in front of their eyes. Was that magic? How is it possible that a missile heading towards something, saying a few words of prayers, how does that change nature? How does it work? Let's delve into the topic of the miraculous and the non-miraculous. And hopefully the last line of the shear in a little while, we'll be able to come back to help a little bit explain what might have happened to our beloved Israeli soldiers I have the schlist. My son is stationed outside of Hebron um, this week. Hashem, we dive in for all the soldiers, but we dive in for miracles and we dive in for the supernatural. There are certain numbers in Judaism that stand out in their representation and their symbolism. We know the number 40. You know, sometimes at the Shabbos table, pick out numbers. You know, the number 40, how many 40s are there? The years in the Midbar and the Mabul and a baby is formed 40 days after conception. Harsinai. 40, 40, 40. The number three is special. Tanakh, the Avos, three pillars the world is created on. So there are many special numbers. I think I saw recently Art Scroll has a whole book about almost every number. Every number is special. But there are certain numbers that, so to speak, are more special and unique than others. And maybe the ones that come to mind the most is the number seven and its relationship to eight. What is it? Seven. There's so many things that are seven. Shabbos, Shemitah. Next year is a Shemitah year. Shabbos, Shemitah, Yovel. The seven nations. 
the weeks of Shvir Omer, the days of Yantif, seven days of Sukkot, seven days of Pesach, and eight. Eight days of Hanukkah. That's what we're getting ready for. The eighth day, Brismila, Shmini Atzeres is after Sukkot. Shvuis is after counting seven weeks. So what is, about, is it about seven and its relationship to eight? So many are familiar with the thought of the Maharal in source number one. The Maharal tells us in the context of Hanukkah, in Ner Mitzvah, what's seven and what's eight? Seven is nature. Seven is symbolic of the natural world. Hashem created the world in seven days because that's nature. Shemitah is all about agriculture. Seven. Seven is, <coughs> are the, um, n- the colors on a rainbow. Roy G. Biv are seven. Every point in the physical world are the six directions and the seven, the midpoint, the anchor. By a lulav, we shake it seven directions. The seven is nature. And eight is beyond. Eight is a step beyond the natural world. Eight is the miraculous. Eight is the supernatural. Brismila, after a, ch- a baby boy, is in the world seven days beyond. Shvu, it's me, except the Torah after we've counted seven, the natural realm. All t- whenever we count to become Tahar, there's seven days of Tuma, whatever it's for, if somebody's Tame Mace, Tame Nida, it's always seven because then Tara comes in the supernatural realm. Says the Maharal, he <laughs> is Shiva Yamim Nivra Ha'olam. Hazeha TV on the second line. Vilafichach, Masha Achra Tebu Tachas Mispar Shmona. Beyond seven is eight. Shmona Hu Achar. And that's Brismila. And if we think about it, these are two very different or def- different ways that we experience life. The seven and the eight, the natural and the supernatural. And we know in Chazal and in the Torah, there's two separate concepts, aren't there? There's nature. And there's the miraculous. Next week will be uh, Rosh Chodesh. We'll say Bar Chinafshi in Shul. Bar Chinafshi is a beautiful tefillah that David Amelik wrote all about nature, talking about the rivers and the animals and Hashem feeds everybody. We believe in something called Teva, something called nature. But we also know that we believe in the miraculous. The Mishnah tells us in Perkyavos in source number two, Asara Nisim Nafasol Migdash. There were 10 miracles that took place in the base of Migdash every single day. And it was clearly the miraculous. The smoke went straight up. The fire, sometimes you've been in Jerusalem, you've been in Yerushalayim, the pouring rain, the fire never went out. The fire kept burning, it went straight up. Nobody ever got sick from all the meat that was in the base of Migdash. Nobody, everybody had plenty of room to bow down. Right? It was, it, was, it was squishy, but you bowed down. And maybe the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle, the last one, Adam Adam Lachavero, Sarli Hamakom. Nobody ever complained to their to their friend that, that there's not enough room here. If you look closely, it doesn't say that there wasn't enough room. That there was enough room. I'm sorry. It says that there they didn't complain about it. They didn't complain about it, and that also was a miracle. So there were mirac- miracles that took place. Mishnah tells us. We know the Gemara tells us the Mishnah. Misachas Brachas. If somebody goes by a spot where a miracle took place, where they experienced the miracle, Rahman al whatever it might have been, Haro Makam Shanasa Bonisim Li Yisrael, you make a make a bracha. Baracha to Hashem al Kinama Halam, Sha'asali Nais Bamakomazeh. So we know there's something called Teva and something called Nais. And something called the miraculous. But if we analyze a little deeper, maybe we will see that the line is blurred between these two concepts, and amazingly, maybe, in different directions. And maybe this is even a machlokas of two of the greatest rabbis of our nation that ever lived, the Rambam and the Ramban, Maimonides and Nachmanides. We'll start off with the Rambam in the Maran of Uchim and the Guide for the Perplexed in source number four. Says the Rambam, you know how we view miracles? Not like we really would have thought. Says the Rambam in source number four where it's underlined. Shehem Amru, Kishabara Hashem Yisbarach Zeham when Hashem created this world. And again, if anybody wants the sheets afterwards, I, I emailed it, and I'm sure Sam or, or the, the Rabbanim could, could email them out to whoever wants a hard copy of the, uh, of the sources afterwards. Kishabara Hashem Yisbarach Hametzius, when Hashem created the world, V'hitbiyu al elu ativim, when He created the laws of nature, Sam b'tivim ahem, sheyischadesh bohem, koma sheyischadesh. May Hanifloos be'ez chidusha. 
Says the Rambam, to use a modern word, every miracle was pre-programmed from my sabracious. There's never anything that changes, that, that there's a new nature or essence of something. When Hashem created the world, he said that water should flow downstream and there should be gravity. But there should be one time later on in history that water should stand up straight. And there should be one time that rocks should float, uh, rain down from heaven. And there should be one time that the sun and the moon should stop. Shemesh begiv on dome. Be'emech, be'emech, alone. Miracles are in a change of nature, says the Rambam. They're pre-programmed from my sabracious. Says the Rambam, why? Where it's underlined? The Zeemu Kamosha Tira Humora Almala Saomer. Because this reflects the greatness of God. If God would have to intervene in the world and change something to achieve a goal, that would reflect an imperfection. But God has to change something. The world isn't perfect. The world isn't Mushlam. No. Kosha Be'en of Ma'od. It's very hard for Hashem. Sheyishtana teva achar ma'isa bracious. That something would change after ma'isa bracious. Or yishchadish ratzon achar shun chusham. Or some other purpose. No. Every, what we call a miracle, was pre-programmed for ma'isa bracious. Uh, why? And that, what it, so that's the Ramah Mar Nebuchim. So the Ramah asks on himself. But doesn't it say in Pirkei Avos, in the next source, in source number five, that there were 10 things that were created at Bein HaShemashos. The last few moments of my sabracious. And what were they? Pia Aretz, the mouth that swallowed up Korach. Pia Be'er, the well that moved with them in the desert. Pia Aton, the donkey that talked to Bilam, the, oh, the Mun, the Shamir, the little worm that cut the rocks. Ask the Rambam if every miracle was pre-programmed for my sabracious. So what's unique about these 10? Why does it say, why does Chazal say, our rabbi said that these 10 were pre-programmed, says the Rambam, you're right, those are just examples. Those were put in in the last few seconds of my sabracious. But really, all the other ones, all the miracles that took place, they took place, they were already programmed when Hashem created water earlier, when Hashem created the animals, and the sun and the moon and the stars. But really, every single miracle that took place in the history of the world, turning over the page, the Rambam says, everything was already put into the program, so to speak. Beratius Asiyas Advarim, he writes on line six, Husam Betivam Sheyasubem called Masha He already put into their nature everything that will be true throughout history. Bain Shehaya Hadavar Sheyaset Tadir, whether it would be something that happens often, like gravity, like water flowing downstream like the sun going up and the moon and the stars. Or things that don't happen too often, and that's what we call miracles. This is the sheet of the Rambam. So if we think about it, we said, yeah, there's two things. There's something called Teva, there's something called Nase. The Rambam just told us that that's not true. Really, there's only one thing, and it's called Teva. It's called nature. It's just that we're not used to miracles, but really it's nature that doesn't happen so often. That's how the Rambam, Maimonides, views the world. It's all one package, but it's all Teva. So this is one line of thought. It's not usually what we think, and the Rambam even notes. If that is true, there's a concept found in a number of sources. I gave it to you from the Rambam, Gersonides and Sefer Shmuel, God does not like to do miracles if he doesn't have to. He doesn't want to. And that's why we have a principle that we're not, re not allowed to rely on a miracle. Ain't somchin alanes. If we're stuck, we could dump it for one, but ain't somchin alanes. Excellent, it's moving, right? <laughs> so says the, uh, so the Rabbag in Sefer Shmuel. Hashem Yisbarach, source number eight. Hashem Yisbarach lo yechadesh hamovsim. Hashem does not like to do miracles. But just where he has to, one second. According to the Rambam, all miracles already were pre-programmed from before. So what's the difference from Hashem's view? Miracles, nature, is all the same from his view. So why is it so hard to do a miracle? It's already in the program. Okay, you might say he doesn't want to take away our free choice to do miracles all the time. But it's a little challenging, a little difficult for the Rambam. What would be the difficulty with God having to do miracles all the time? So maybe there's another way of viewing and understanding things. 
maybe exactly the opposite. And this view we'll see through the eyes of the Ramban. Again, a Ramban that many of you might, might know already. I've mentioned it often in other shiurim, but it's the Ramban and Parsha's bow. I call it a top 10 Ramban. Top 10 Rambans. This Ramban is a, I'm going to call it a refrigerator Ramban, you know, whatever it is. It used to be in the olden days that, as you, we remember, the, the front of the fridge used to be magnetic. You could put things on it. You know, now it's all the fancy refrigerators. It's smooth. Maybe the sides, if we're lucky, we could put some pictures on and magnets. But, you know, whatever, whatever works. But either way, we can still call it a refrigerator Ramban. So the Ramban tells us in, in the end of Parsha's bow, I gave you the answer in source number nine. But what's the question? The Ramban is dealing with the question of why are there so many mitzvos that are zeicher lisias mitzrayim? So many mitzvos, right? There's, there's Pesach and Tefillin and Pidyon Aben and Petach Hamor and Shabbos and, and Yantif and <laughs> so many. What's so bad? What's in second place? How many mitzvos are there to remember Maimon Ar Sinai? Maybe one. How many mitzvahs are they to remember that Hashem gave us the man? Maybe. A mitzvah to Rabban on Lecha Mishnah. How many mitzvahs for Ananiya Kavid? One. It's not even close. It's not even close. Why are there so many mitzvahs that are Zechel Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim? We have nothing against Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim. I like to give the mashal. I once heard, if I asked, how many, how many mefarshim do we have over the past 900 years explaining Rashi on Chumash? How many svarim do you think there are? If you do a Google search, at least 600. The Lubavitcher Rebbe himself has about 10, right? It was Yad Kislev yesterday. But there are hundreds. Who's in second place? Who, which, which commentary has, mo- has the most super commentaries written on him? After Rashi, the Ramban. How many? About six. It's not even close. Rashi is way beyond the godless of Rashi. Right? So you see, Yitzhak Mitzrayim was amazing, but there's not another event in our history that's even close, says the Ramban, I'll explain. Source number nine. Let me tell you why there are so many mitzvos. From the time that there, were, there was heresy in the world. There have been so many different types of heretics in the world, says the Ramban. Some of them deny everything. There was no creator. Right? The world was always here. No such thing. Most don't assume that. Most don't assume that the world just happened. What? It was just an explosion. Usually when it's an explosion, it's a mess, not a perfect world. A perfect world where the scientists point out that if the earth was a drop closer to the sun, we'd, we'd all melt. And if it was a drop a millimeter further from the sun, we'd all freeze. And, and, the, and the, everything about the world, we think about it. So oh, Come on, that just happened. So most say, okay, there was a creator. Of course, there was a creator, but he's a busy God. He's got other universes to take care of. He's a gozer. So there's other types of heretics. Some deny creation. Some say there was creation, but they deny knowledge and God's involvement in the world. And number three, He knows, but he's not omnipotent. He can't do everything he wants. He might be Metzitz, but he's not Mashkiach. How does Hashem in one moment, in one fell swoop, undermine all of these heretical views and prove that there is a creator, he's involved, and he can do whatever he wants by performing a miracle, says the Ramban. And if it's forecast by a prophet beforehand, it's even better. Because a miracle does what? Says the Ramban. Ki amofes hanifla mora. The mofes. The, uh, the second uh, underlined line over there. A, a miracle shows, that there is a God. The Yodei and he knows. And he's in control. The Yochel, he can do whatever he wants. That's what a miracle does. It shows HaKadosh Baruch who is in charge. When was the most miraculous time period in our history? Says the Ramban, you see, it's right. Hashem's not going to do miracles forever. That's not what life's about. But Hashem wants us to constantly remember Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim over and over again. Shema, every day. Zechir Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Sibri Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Tefillin, and Mezuzah. So many mitzvahs so that we always remember that even though there are miracles going on every day in front of our eyes, Kodesh Baruch is in charge. Kodesh Baruch is in charge. 
And through the miracles, turning the page now, if you want to scroll down towards the end of the source, okay, we're not going to read everything inside. And through remembering the open miracles, are the mode benisim nistarim, shemi soda tarakula, through remembering the open miracles, we remember and are admit and recognize the hidden miracles. And here's this unbelievable sh- strong line. She'ein la'adam chelek b'tar as Moshe Rabbeinu. A person doesn't have a portion in the Torah of Moshe. At and until we believe. B'chot v'areinu mikreinu. That everything that happens to us, to us. She'kulam nisim. Ein bo'em teva u'minhago shal olam. It's all miracles. There's no such thing as teva. Says the Ramban. And that's why even the word nes, Rav Asher Weiss points out. I didn't give it to you. But what does the word nace mean? Miracle. There's another meaning for the word nace. We say it every day in our Amida. What's a nace? A flag. A banner. A banner. A banner. A flag. Right? What's a name? When you wave something, hey, I'm here. Right? When man walks on moon, you stick a flag. You say, we're here. We're, we, we have authority here. We're, we could be, we're still here. That's what a nace is. A, a nace is Hashem waving his flag. Hey, guys, remember me? That's why there are so many mitzvahs that are zechle says Mitzray. If we take a step back now, it's pretty amazing. What did the Ramban just tell us? Isn't, he blurred the lines also, like the Ramban, between nace and tava, but exactly in exactly the opposite direction. While the Rambam said that there's no such thing as nace, it's all tava, the Ramban tells us there's no such thing as teva but it's all nace. It's all miracles that we're used to. And if we might say it as a catchphrase, Mother Nature has a father, according to the Ramban. And that's the message that we get from all the mitzvahs that are Zeich Leitzies Mitzrayim. So we're going to go with the Ramban's approach. That's the one that's more accepted by the Mepharshim. But again, there's, a mess- there's important messages from the Rambam as well. But let's expand a little bit on the Ramban's idea. Two of the great achronim of the past century, used the Ramban and, and um, illustrated the Ramban in their own way. First, the Meshachachma. The Meshachachma, in, well, story, before the Meshachachma, he talks about the two Gemaras in 12 and 13. The Meshachachma says we have two Gemaras. One Gemara tells us the beginning of Masechah's Brachos. Some of you doing Dafyom, we did it a couple last year. The Gemara Masechah's Brachos says that if we say Ashrei every single day, it's a one-way ticket to Olam Haba. One-way ticket to Olam Haba, the Gemara Masechah's Brachos. Wow. So if we say some of Tehillim every day, Poseches Yodecha, Olam Haba. And yet the Gemara says in Shabbos, which you have a bold face there now in source number 12, if somebody says Halal every day, it doesn't mean Halal, what we call Halal, maybe it means what we say on Shabbos, Kili Olam Chasto, Hareza Machari from Magadif. That's a blasphemer. They're both Tehillim. How could one Gemara say that if we say Tehillim, Ashrei, every single day, we go to Olam Haba? And the other Gemara in Shabbos, if we say Halal every day, it's a blaspheming God. How is a blaspheming God? Says the Meshachachma. And again, I'm not going to read everything inside to save time. But says the Meshachachma, because what's Ashrei about and what's Halal Hagadol about? What's Halal about? It's about the miraculous. It's about Sheba Shefleinu Zachar Lanu, Og Melech Abasha, and Kili Olam Chasto. Right, all the list of the miracles that took place in the Midbar. If we say howl every day, that would reflect that we recognize that Hashem is in charge of the miraculous. That's not what Hashem's interested in. The miraculous, that's not an ends. I'm sorry, that's not an ends or a goal itself. That's a means. And that's what the Meshachach Marah writes on the fourth line. Hanhaga hanisis hi eina tachlitit. That's not the goal. What's Ashrei about? He takes care of every creature in the world. That's about nature. And that's why. That's a one-way ticket to Olam Habit. If we recognize, not that Hashem is in charge of the miracles, but that the miracles reflect that He's even in charge of the Nisim. That's a one-way ticket to Olam Habit. That's the Meshachach. The Mechlem el of Dessler, which I didn't give you. I just gave you the source. In source 15, the Mechlem el of Dessler says, let me give you a mashal. Again, illustrating the Ramban. Imagine, imagine you're at your kitchen window, you're looking into your backyard, and all of a sudden you see the ground rumbling. Like, what is going on here? And all of a sudden you look, and you see a finger, a finger that sticks out of the ground. You're like, oh my gosh, am I dreaming? You pinch yourself, and then afterwards you see a hand come out of the ground. You see an arm. 
So quickly you get, you take a selfie, you there, there, there. make sure, you know, if you don't take a picture nowadays, it didn't happen, right? So you do this, your mamish witness to Chiyas Amazing. Amazing. <coughs> Shocking. Let me ask you this. Let's say you're looking out your kitchen window, and all of a sudden you see the ground rumbling, and all of a sudden you see a leaf come out of the ground. And after the leaf, you see a branch, and then a thicker branch, and then a trunk. You see a tree grow. And you're not in shock. Says of Desla, what's the difference between a tree growing and Trias Amesim? He says, nothing. It's just what we're used to. Mitzat Hashem, it's the same thing. What, we put a seed in the ground, it's normal to get an apple, to get a big tree? It's the same thing. Kodesh Baruch Hu does this, Kodesh Baruch Hu does that. Like the Ramban says, there's no such thing as Teva. It's Kulones. Ramesh HaChachma in his way, and Rav Desla in his way. This attitude of the Ramban could also help us appreciate three of the basic yesodos of our religion. And then we'll get to Hanukkah. Three basic yesodos of our religion. Number one is tefillah. Tefillah, an appreciation of prayer. The Rambam tells us in Surah 16, and the Ramban, a well-known machlokas, whether prayer each and every day is a mitzvah, De Orisa, one of the 613. The Rambam says, yes, 100%. It's a mitzvah to daven every single day of our life. Mitzvah saseilis, palel b'chol yom, shenemar, v'yavatam Hashem l'kecha. Serve Hashem. Serve Hashem in your heart. How do you serve Hashem in your heart? By praying. Avod Hashem believes utfilo, the first off in Mesechus Tainus. Prayer is a mitzvah every single day. The details of prayer are derabanan, a rabbinic. How many, and when, and how. But the idea of turning to God every single day is a mitzvah daraisa, one of the 613. And the Ramban says no. The Ramban says it's a great idea. It's a great idea and you should, but it's not counted as one of the 613, except in one circumstance. Ace Tzara. Time of national, universal calamity. If somebody's sick, if there's a natural disaster, if there's a pandemic, any type of Ace Tzara, Says the Ramban, then is a mitzvah. I agree, it's a mitzvah to daven then in those circumstances. This is a machlokas between the Rambam and the Ramban. Says Rav Salvechik, and again, I, didn't, I couldn't uh, make the sheets because I didn't have it on the computer. Says Rav Salvechik, you can look it up, it's in Reflections of the Rub, the first volume, probably in the shul somewhere. I don't know if the library probably is off limits during Corona, but when you get back to the shul, Hashem, you, could, uh, you can look. Says Rav Salvechik in Reflections of the Rav, maybe the Ramban, who says it's a mitzvah to daven every single day, and the Ramban, who says only at a time of Ace Sarah, maybe at root they're saying the same yesod, the same root. Really, prayer is only obligatory at a time of Ace Sarah. Even the Rambam agrees to that. The question is how to define Ace Sarah. The Ramban says, if somebody's sick, if there's national calamity, something's going on. The Rambam says, life is an asara. What, there's natural? I had money yesterday, so that means I'm going to have money tomorrow? A person with health, was healthy yesterday? Right, what, is, what is, there used to be a motto of some, uh, of investment firm. You know, past results are no guarantee for future, uh, you know, future results. Life is an asara. Whatever happens today, who knows what's going to be tomorrow? And we know that very well over the past nine months. We've been taught that. We had plans for Pesach. We had plans for the summer. We had plans for Sukkot. We had plans. And guess what? Man plans and God laughs. Because we realize life is an ace sorrow. And one can only pray properly with that attitude. When we realize it's all up to him, capital H. It's not up to us. Then we can daven properly. That there's nothing natural about our existence. Hashem's in charge. And that's a Ramban type of attitude, even though here the, it's flipped, as we can talk about it another time. But the idea of prayer being an Esara says that's an idea that flows from the Ramban's idea that all of life, there's no such thing as nature. But rather, it is, it is, all, te, all, is all the miraculous. Tefillah. Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, those who cannot be in Yerushalayim right now, we have to talk about Yerushalayim, and you're into Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, the Pasuk tells us in Tehillim, Habanuya ki'ir shechubra layachtov. It's a city that unites, that brings things together. What does it bring together? What does it bring together? What does Yerushalayim bring together? The mountains come together. The Malbim tells us. The Malbim tells us, Yerushalayim. Why did David choose Yerushalayim? Those who are Navi, Baruch Hashem, 
Navi Shear, those who are listening to the Navi Shear right now, we're in, we started with Yeshua a bunch of years ago, eight years ago. Now we're in Sefer, Daniya, Sefer uh, Nehemiah. But anyway, way back in um, Sefer Shmuel Beis, right? David HaMelech moves from Hebron after seven years. He moves to Yerushalayim. Why did he move to Yerushalayim? He had a vision that the base of Miglis was supposed to be there. Explains the Malbim. Because he wanted to unify two Shvatim. The border of two Shvatim. Border of two Shvatim. Go right to Yerushalayim. Right? Who are those? Yehuda and Binyamin. Right through the base of Migdash. David wanted to go and have the base, have his, have that as the capital city. Why? What does Yehuda and Binyamin symbolize? Says the Nitziv on the Pasik in Parshas Vayechi. I didn't give it to you. Says the Nitziv, Yehuda is about Teva. David fought wars. Binyamin, Shaul. That was about Nais. It's a city where Nais and Teva come together. That's Yerushalayim. All of us who have had the schus of walking the streets of Yerushalayim feel it. It's not a city, it's a city unlike all others. It's physical. You see stones, you see old buildings, but you feel it's it's not natural. It's not Teva. It's the most miraculous city. Harabai is 1967 taught us that it's a miraculous city. Yerushalayim. It looks like Teva, but it's really nice. So Tefillah is about recognizing the Ramban's idea. Yerushalayim is about that. And one more unbelievable thought from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Eretz Yisrael itself. Back in Sefer Yehoshua, the Pasuk tells us that though throughout the Midbar, the Aron went in between the Shvatim, two before, two after, Crossing the Yardin on the 10th of Nisan where they went in, the Pesukim and Yeshua tell us, the Aaron went first. The Aaron went first. After three days, Yeshua tells them, when you see the Aaron, go after the Aaron. Says the Lubavitcher Rebbe, there's something deep going on here. B'nai Yisrael up until this point have had a miraculous existence. The Mon, the Be'er, the Ananiah covered surrounding them. They're about to go into Eretz Yisrael. Everything's going to change. They're going to be farmers. They're going to have to work. They're going to fi- have to fight nations. They're about to go into a natural existence. It was spiritual. Their shoes grew with them. When they're about to start, Hashem says, Go after the Aron. Why? What's the Aron? The Aron was made up of physical raw materials. We read about it in Parsha's Truma. There was wood and gold and wood and Kruvim, and they made it. So it was physical, but nothing about the Aron was physical or natural. Right? The Aron, Chazal say, carried itself. No says no sub, right? It carried. It didn't take up any space in the Kodesh Kadashim. It didn't make any sense. It shouldn't have fit there. It should have stuck out. Because it was all supernatural. The Aron is a microcosm. Symbolizes Nais and Teva coming together. Yeshua says, go into Eretz Yisrael, because Eretz Yisrael is a place that it looks like Teva. But it's all natural. It's all supernatural. It's all Nais. How could six, seven, six million Jews live here today in Eretz Yisrael, surrounded by billions of people who don't want us to be here? But how could, how could Amis all survive and flourish over the past couple hundred years when after this World War II, they said, forget it, Judaism is gone throughout the world, but specifically in the land of Israel. How many Jews were in, were in, uh, were in Eretz Yisrael in 19, 1945? A couple thousand, now a couple million. Eretz Yisrael is a place that it looks like Teva, but it's really Nais. So the Ramban's idea of Teva being Nais helps us, the Meshachachm and the, and the Michlem Elior of Dessler, illustrated it, but now we use it to help us give us appreciation of tefillah, of prayer. Like it's all Eitzara. Yerushalayim, it's a city of, that unifies Nais and Teva, and maybe Eretz Yisrael in general. And finally, maybe Hanukkah itself. Question that many ask, what do we need the Nais of, of, Nais, of Ner Hanukkah for? After all, you know, Tumahucha B'Tzibor, we didn't need it. Says the Maharal. I didn't give it to you, I don't think, no. But we needed the nace of the Shemen to make sure that we didn't misunderstand the nace of the war. Because military victories, you know, even if it's miraculous, it could be explained. We had a great plan. Rabin Ramiatim. Look at the nace of the, of the oil. Remember what this is. 
This is all about the miraculous. It's not about Teva. So this is the message of the Rambam. The question is just to bring us home. It's hard. It's hard to view that. We see Teva. It's hard to always recognize that. How could we ourselves inculcate this message of the Ramban that helps us with so many things? How could we inculcate that into our lives? Right? What we say so far, just to summarize up until now, we saw the Rambam and the Ramban. How to view Nase and Teva. The Rambam says all of Teva, all of Nase is really Teva, the Ramban. All of Teva is really Nase. And we expanded on the Ramban. The Meshachachma, that's Ashrei versus Halel. Michtam Elio. That's a tree growing in Tchias HaMesim. That's Tefillah. That's Yerushalayim. That's Eretz Yisrael. And now we're at, that's Hanukkah. And now we're asking, but how do we, how do we make sure that we feel it? Says Rav Dessler and say, a number of the Alam HaFarshim, proper prayer. The Gemara tells us in Psachim, a Parnasa is just like Kriyas Yamsuf. What's the connection between Parnasa and Kriyas Yamsuf? Says Rav Dessler, Says first the Rashbam, source 25, Rashi's grandson. Let me boy Rachami. When we dive in, we have to recognize that just like we know Kriyas Yamsov comes from God, so too our Parnasa and all nature and everything in life comes from Hashem. And the more we dive in, the more that can make us, make us feel it. Rav Hirsch writes, Lehis Palel, when we dive in, we don't say things that we already know, but the davening itself helps us know it. When we say Rafainu Hashem B'nei Rafay, when we say it, when we declare it, that helps us feel it. That helps us recognize that Hashem is in charge of everything. And I know I'm running out of time, so I would read it more, but not only does prayer help us, but maybe prayer could even help bring the miracle itself. What happened? How could a missile upon the recitation of a Torah verse blatantly violate the laws of physics, aerodynamics, and gravity? What could happen? Now we can understand how a 19-year-old soldier on a hilltop in Lebanon could work a miracle that saved his life. It was not the words of the verse which magically deflected the missile. By the way, this is from Sari Yocheved Rigler, an article of hers. It was not the words of the verse which deflected the missile. Rather, the words of the verse, Hashem Hu Alokim Ein Od Mil Vado, reminded Menachem of the truth which had been inculcated into him by his religious upbringing. As soon as he thought whatever God wants to happen will happen, if he doesn't want it, it won't. He acknowledged that the missile has no existence independent of God. This recognition disempowered the deadly missile that was hurtling towards him. Menachem understood that the same God who makes missiles fly straight can make missiles do porpoise leaps in midair. So God did just that for Menachem. So the miraculous is not just something that we can believe more by declaring it in our prayers and davening with a proper perspective, but we could even yearn to bring it for what the world and the Jewish people are yearning for now. We're yearning for miracles. We're yearning for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to come down and say, this is it. This is going to be it. We're looking for next week's parsha, And we know if we daven hard enough and we have the proper perspective of everything that happens in our life, Hashem Yazor, we'll see next week's parsha. We'll see post-corona, we'll be able to learn Torah, not only virtually, and not only being able to see, but be able to feel, be able to, to, to be in the same room, be in the same area. And it should happen speedily in our days. Everyone should have a Chanukah Sameach, a wonderful Yantif, and uh, we should see light in the world, light in the, all over the world very soon. Thank you very Thank much you. again for all the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Raz, for coming. It's a huge schluss having you with us. Um, do you do you have time for one or two questions or do sure you, sure okay so we have time for two questions where maybe Schwartz is going to log on at ten oh five so we'll take two questions does anyone have any or comments anybody want to say anything about anything it's fine <laughs> well well I'll just say if people are thinking of questions I'll just say thank you to you I actually I was in Shalvim in 2013 and uh -huh. I went to your chug in Hilcho Special. And uh, now we have a daily halacha WhatsApp group for people in the shul in Stanford, and we're getting up to Hilcha Special this week. So oh, wow. thanks to you, I have some of the background in there before we start learning it. Amazing, amazing. Keep okay. going, keep going strong. Again, Hashem, Hashem didn't, uh, you know, this didn't happen 20, 30 years ago where it would have been even more challenging to, to keep together, to see each other, to, uh, to learn together. You know, Baruch Hashem, we have Zoom. Baruch Hashem, we have WhatsApp. 
you know, we're able to, to stay as connected as we can. And uh, we'll do, we do our best trying to, uh, to keep up with the, uh, the Hebra nature. But again, feel free. It's wonderful, really wonderful to hear uh, how everybody's listening. And uh, we're connected. We're connected even if uh, we don't see each other, but we are communicating and staying connected through the Torah, which is the greatest connection in the world. So everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and, uh, and everybody have a, have a wonderful Yantif. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi Rosner. Kol Tov. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, again. I'm supposed to be feeding a refreshments to everybody now through Zoom. Um, the latkes are, are waiting in your refrigerator, and we'll be starting soon. Okay, we don't have to sign off and sign on again. No, so we'll, we'll leave the session open. Rabbi okay. Schwartz should log on. He'll start his class at 10.05. So this is a chance if you want to get up, make yourself yeah. another cup of coffee, Right, you know, make an omelet or something. This is the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll be back in five minutes. Rabbi Schwartz, good to see you. Oh, Sam, wow. This is like a blast from the past. Blast from the past. Blast God. From the past. How are you? Wow. Thank God. Good. I want to introduce you to someone. Okay. Little Sam. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> What's his name? How old is he? What's your name? Gabriel. Gabriel. Hi, Gabriel. How are you? Good to see you. What's your building? I a rocket ship. A rocket ship. That's, that's a great thing to build. That's really wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye, Sam. Uh, I mean, Sam is here. Bye, Gabriel. <laughs> that, so that happened the last few years. <laughs> oh. Okay, and another one. Too. You chose a really good community, Baruch Hashem. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Rebbe. Good, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, Rabbi Kurtz. Good morning, Rabbi Cohen. Thank you for inviting me. We'll give everyone just, uh, we told everyone 10.05, so they're making themselves an extra cup of coffee, a bagel, an omelet, whatever everyone does in their own homes. So Wine. No one's offering me any coffee, apparently. <laughs> Usually they ship food from Washington Heights to us. We get from the Chinese restaurant at YU. So. Okay. Not often do we ship to Washington Heights. All right.
Hey, there's Gabriel again. Hi, Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel's going to learn some Tyra. He was our, uh, our third speaker that we had slotted for today. <laughs> okay. I think we're good, Rebbe, Rebbe Cohen. You ready? I think we're good. Let's do it. Okay. Um, welcome again to everybody uh, for our pre Hanukkah Yom Yun. Uh, thanks for joining for our first year uh, with Rabbi uh, Rosner and Rabbi uh, Schwartz. It's really uh, a pleasure to have you uh, as part of our uh, virtual learning program. Um, I know Rabbi Kurtz will do the uh, formal intro in a moment, uh, but I want to thank you on behalf of my daughters who are big fans of yours, um, Adina and Eli Sheva, who were Chabruses at Stern College uh, learning with you. Um, you really helped them build on a, a wonderful foundation they gained at Maya Note. They enjoy learning Gemara together. Um, we have Chabruses now learning uh, together, and uh, they're both, thank God, uh, learning well and thriving in Yerushalayim. So I want to thank you uh, for serving as a role model for them. Um, and all you do, uh, not only in general for your community, uh, but also to advance the women's Torah learning. So Yash Shekoach, Shem should bless you and your family. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I'll turn it over to Rabbi Kurtz, um, who will give you a, a more formal introduction and personal one, I know. Amen. Right. Well, you know, the, the challenge of, uh, thank you, Rebbe, for being here this morning. The challenge of introducing someone of a high caliber is that, you know, if you try giving the whole list of bullet points, you kind of fail to encapsulate everything. But just a few things for those of us who haven't had the schuss to meet Rev. Ezra Schwartz yet. Uh, Rev. Ezra Schwartz is a Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshiva University and also serves as the Bochin, which means the examiner. If you want to get into REITs, you got to go through him. And uh, in addition to that, Rev. Ezra Schwartz recently for numerous years served as the rabbi of, of the um, Mount Sinai Jewish Center in Washington Heights. Uh, had a very prestigious rabbinic career and is now focused working at Yish University, not only on the men's campus, teaching as a Rosh Yeshiva rabbinical classes, but also as Rabbi Cohen noted, he dedicates much of his time to ensuring the advancement of women's Talmud and women's Torah learning. He, uh, I don't know what it works like now with Zoom. I don't know if Rebbe needs to make the commute anymore, but uh, back in the day, you could see Rev. Ezra Schwartz going on the inter-campus uh, van between YU and Stern campus to give his Gemara Shear to the women there. And now also gives a Gemara Shear for women who are living in Washington Heights as well. So it's a very wonderful opportunity. Rev. Schwartz really mixes and synthesizes what it means to be a Rosh Yeshiva in the academic and learned sense but also being a rabbi who's reaching outside the ivory tower and making sure to bring Torah to the broader modern Orthodox community. There's much more to say, but we have a limited time together. So I want to turn the mic to my Rebbe, Rev. Ezra Schwartz, who, fun fact, he was also our Masada Kiddushin. He officiated my wedding. So uh, many fond memories together and looking forward to many more. Hey, Yashikoa, thank you, um, Rabbi Kurtz. I really appreciate this invitation. Um, Rabbi Cohen, um, thank you for your warm comments. If I'm not mistaken, I see Adina Cohen is Dina, on yeah, sure. this call now. So yeah. I'm actually nervous because Adina Cohen has a way of asking really good questions. So now I am a little more scared than I would be otherwise. Um, oh, Rabbi, full, full disclosure, Eli Sheva lives in the same apartment as Adina. So it could be you have two for the price of one. I don't know. <laughs> that, right now it's yeah. just me, but Eli Sheva might join. I'm here oh. also on a different Oh, way. she's here. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so it's really wonderful to see both of you and to know that you're in Israel is just, just so special. Okay, Chevra, Hanukkah is coming up. And I want to learn with you a question which I have never thought about very much, which is we know that Hanukkah happened during the Second Temple period. But what exactly did Hanukkah look like at that time? What was that first Hanukkah like? Was it the same as the Hanukkah that we experience today? Or perhaps there were some differences. And what do those differences tell us about what the real meaning of Hanukkah is? 
So the first source of Chanukah you have here on the sheet, it's a well-known Gemara in Shabbos. The Gemara asks, my Chanukah, what is Chanukah? And they tell us the famous story on the 25th day of Kislev, there are eight days of Chanukah. Interestingly, this source comes from Megillus Tanis. Megillus Tanis is the oldest Talmudic source that we are aware of. Megillus Tanis is a source that the Gemara teaches us no longer applies. It had all of these various holidays because so-and-so dedicated X, Y, and Z to the Beis HaMikdash. These holidays are no longer observed. There are only two days from Megillus Tanis that remain on our calendar, and those are the days of Chanukah and Purim. The rest of Megillus Tanis no longer exists. And the Gemara tells us, what exactly is Hanukkah? On the 25th day of Kislev, there are eight days of Hanukkah. We don't eulogize in those days. We don't fast on these days. And the reason is that when the Seleucid Greeks entered the temple and they tim ukalashmanim shebehecho, they were metame, they defiled all the oils. And then the chashmonaim won. They checked, they only found one jug of oil, it had the seal of the Kohen Gadol, there's only enough to light for a single day, and the miracle happened, and it lit for eight days. And the next year, they established Chanukah as a yontiv, Bahalel v'hoda'ah. We're all familiar with this source, um, that the nais of Chanukah is because of the Pach Shemen, because of the miracle of discovery of the oil. Well-known source. But I want to emphasize two points over here. Point one is Rashi comments. My Chanukah, Zakt Rashi, al Eizenes Kav Uha. What's the miracle for which they established the Yantiv of Chanukah? Meaning, Rashi is well aware that there are two different miracles. There's the miracle of finding that one cruise of oil on that lit for eight days. It's like a cell phone battery that goes on and on, even though you're at that tiny little red zone. That's one miracle. But Rashi is aware. There's a miracle of the war and there's a miracle of the cruise of oil. Rashi's asking, which is the miracle for which the Yontiv of Chanukah was established? al kav uha. And Rashi tells us, or the Gemara tells us that the miracle is the miracle of the cruise of oil. Apparently, the idea is that the cruise of oil somehow demonstrates that the war was also miraculous. People often think, especially the way Chanukah has been used in the modern state of Israel and the like, people think that Chanukah represents a military victory. But that cruise of oil demonstrates that the miracle is really, it's not just that we had better arms, it's not just that we were better military tacticians, but the idea is that there is a miraculous event. So the cruise of oil, to pardon the pun, sheds light on the war. That's the first point that I think Rashi is making. But the next point of Rashi, I think, is really worthy of our analysis, and this will be our topic. Zakt Rashi, Hachi Garsinon, that means there is some other text available, but the text that Rashi has is Asa'um Yamim Tovim Bahalel Bahoda'a. They make it a yuntiv that we say Halel and Hoda'a. The text that Rashi does not have is Kiva'um, the Asa'um Yamim Tovim. There was a text that they established the day and they made it a holiday. That other text implies that there are two different dimensions. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Rashi says the yantiv of Chanukah is a day, behalel vehoda'a, lo shasurim b'malacha, shelo nikbu el likros ha'hala, velo ma'al hanisim b'hoda'a. Rashi says that Chanukah is now Osir b'malacha. You're allowed to go to work on Chanukah. My kids say that Chanukah is their favorite yantiv because on most yamim tovim, they can't um, play on the computer and they don't get gifts. On Pesach, they get gifts, but they can't play on the computer. Chanukah is the one yantiv that they can play on the computer and they get gifts. That's why it's their favorite yantiv. But what Rashi is saying is, the Chanukah is a day that it's lo shasur b'malacha, we're allowed to play on the computer, 
but they instituted the yantiv likros halel veloma al hanisim behodaa. The yantiv is that we read halel and we say al hanisim in davening. So what's absent from Rashi's presentation? They established the yantiv for halel and hodaa. What's missing in Rashi? So the answer is the candles. Lighting the menorah is absent, no? The lighting of the candles. It, it's striking. There is no lighting of candles in Rashi's description of <laughs> It's not there. The entire yuntiv <laughs> is Halel and Hoda. That's really striking. And if you look at the next source, the Bach, the Bach lived from 1561 to 1640. Um, he's a well-known figure in the world of halacha. He's the rabbi in Krakow. Um, his son-in-law is the famous Taz. His other son-in-law is the famous Avodas Hagir Shuni, a well-known figure. The Bach was actually quite wealthy. He was upset that his son-in-law, the Taz, took a small rabbinic position and he didn't earn much money. But the Bach comments, first he speaks about how there are two different texts. And if you have the text of Kiva'um Asaum. So that text would imply that part of the yuntiv of Hanukkah is lighting the candles. But according to the text that only has asa'um, the text that Rashi has, so the Bach notes, and I underline these words, kasha mimashlo huzgar gam hadloka shehu ikar. The Bach asks, how come lighting candles is absent from the description of Hanukkah? especially when the miracle that we're emphasizing is the miracle of the discovery of that cruise of oil. Why would it be that lighting the menorah is not part of the yontiv of Hanukkah? The original Hanukkah only had Halel, only had Hoda'a. There is no lighting of the menorah. And as we'd say in Yiddish, farvos nisht. Why not? So I'd like to suggest that the reason why they did not light the menorah is because they didn't have to. They have a menorah. That menorah is the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash. You don't need an imposter. You don't need a fake menorah, a menorah in your own home when you got the real McCoy. So what Rashi is telling me is the original yuntiv of, ha- of Hanukkah was just that I say Halel and Hoda'a. Later on, at some unknown time in history, they instituted lighting the menorah, the Hanukkiah, whatever you want to call it. But originally, that is not part of the yuntiv. If that's the case, So then when I light the Hanukkah candles today, what I'm really doing is I am replicating the Hanukkah that they had in the Beis HaMikdash. I would argue that they did not light the Hanukkah so long as the second temple's around, that it was instituted after Chor ben Habayis, and it was instituted to commemorate what they used to have. And there are a number of halachas that emerge from this description. For example, the halacha that is well known is we're not allowed to derive benefit from the Hanukkah candles. And then we shown them have a whole discussion. I believe Elisheva was in my shir when we learned um, these Hanukkah sugyos um, and Adina. But there's a whole discussion in the Rishonim as to what exactly can you not do when the Hanukkah candles are burning? Are you allowed to learn Torah? Can you do a mitzvah to the light of the Hanukkah candles? So the Ran famously suggests, the Ran in his comments on the riff, the Ran says, you can't even do a mitzvah when the Hanukkah candles are burning because those Hanukkah candles are like the lights in the Beis HaMikdash and just like the lights in the Beis HaMikdash were hectic, 
they have a higher level of Kedusha and you can't do anything, you can't have any benefit from those lights. Even mitzvah benefits, so also you can't do anything with the lights of the Chanukiah. That idea that the Chanukah candles that we light today are a replication of what they had in the Beis HaMikdash is reflected elsewhere. There's a whole discussion, we did it recently in Dafyomi, about what is the proper text of brachos. Do I make a bracha with the term le, right? Or do I make the bracha with the term al? When you do bedikas chametz, do you say live er, or excuse me, or live dok, whatever the term is, or do I say al bi or chametz? That's a discussion in the Gemara. And many of the Rishonim have a comment that when it comes to rabbinic mitzvos, we always make the bracha al. But by Torah mitzvos, we say the bracha le. The Ravid, the Ravid died in 1197. The Ravid is in Pasquier, is in the French Riviera. The Ravid famously comments that rabbinic mitzvos, you say al. Torah mitzvos, you use the text of the bracha le. So then the Ravid Frekta Kasha, the Ravid asks, well, how come? How come Chanukah, we say Lehad Litner Chanukah? We should say Al, because it's a rabbinic mitzvah. So the Ravid answers, no, it's not. It's a mitzvah that replicates the Torah mitzvah. It replicates what they did in the Beis HaMikdash. And therefore the text is the same text that they used to use. Again, this idea of Chanukah, the lighting of candles, being a replacement for what they did in the Beis HaMikdash, it has a number of expressions in the Halacha. It's expressed most particularly when we light Chanukah candles in Shul. Lighting Chanukah candles in the Gemara is only found at home. Lighting in Shul is also some later enactment when, I'm not sure, but the lighting in Shul is really a reenactment of what was done in the Beis HaMikdash. The Vilna Gon writes that the placement of the menorah in Shul is on the southern wall. Because the southern wall is where the menorah was in the Beis HaMikdash. The Rambam tells us when they lit the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash, they would light the menorah at night and again in the morning. Most of us don't do this at home, no? Does anyone that you know light the Chanukah candles in the morning at home? I'm not aware of anyone. But in Shul, I don't know what you do in Stanford. That's the truth. Um, but in many Shuls where I have been, the practice is that they light the menorah again at Shachris without a bracha. What's the idea? The idea is that the lighting of candles, specifically the lighting in Shul, that's a replacement for what they did in the Beis HaMikdash. And therefore it is governed by so many of the rules that, take, that took place in the Beis HaMikdash. And so um, Susan asks, I thought you're not supposed to light Hanukkah candles in daylight. That's absolutely true. The real mitzvah of Hanukkah candles is at night. However, however, in Shul, in order to replace what they did in the Beis HaMikdash, where they would make sure that all the oil is consumed, they would light the Chanukah candles during the day as well. Um, the practice in German communities, in fact, is that they light Chanukah candles, which are extremely large. If you go to Breuer's in Washington Heights, where I live, they have these massively tall Chanukah candles and they burn all night. They burn all night. The idea is that they should burn and then continue burning until the morning, the way it was done in the Beis HaMikdash. The Rambam writes that if the candles did not burn all night, you relight them in the morning. But the idea of candles in Shul is a replacement. It's to replicate the candles that were burnt, the candles or the nails, I should say, in the Beis HaMikdash. And I think that is especially true if we understand that at those original Hanukkahs, they did not light the candles at all. Now, this presentation 
is not true according to everyone. I like it. I like it. Um, I like stuff that I think of in general. Um, but there are others who completely disagree. The She'otos and Rebbe Choygon. The She'otos is the first known work that we have post-Talmud. Rebbe Choygon lived 680 until 752. He actually moved from Bavel to Eretz Yisrael. Um, the text is written in the Aramaic that was used in Eretz Yisrael at that time period. It's slightly different than Babylonian Aramaic. But the Sheiltos has a different text of the Gemara than we have. The Gemara that we have is my Chanukah. Why did they establish the Yontiv of Chanukah? But look at the Sheiltos' text. There was no translation on Sepharia of the Sheiltos. So my Ner Chanukah, the Sheiltos says. Why do they light the candles? And the Shodos tells the same story because they found that cruise of oil, etc. Meaning, lighting of the candles of Hanukkah, the Shoto says, is because of the oil. It's because of that miracle. You get the impression that for the Shotos, lighting of the candles was also in replication or in recognition of that original miracle of finding the cruise of oil and lighting of the candles was done at the time of the Beis HaMikdash as well. I want to analyze this more in one minute, but just one brief aside in the Sheiltos is that there's another difference between the text of the Sheiltos and the text that we have in the Gemara. I underlined it at the bottom. The Sheoto says, remember, they find this cruise of oil. The way we have the Gemara, it says that they only had enough oil to light for one day. But the Sheoto writes, <laughs> They did not have enough oil even for a single day. You know, everyone asks the question, how come you need eight days of Hanukkah? There's really seven days of miracle because the first day it's going to burn anyway. And there's like hundreds and hundreds of answers. Like everyone thinks of at least 20 answers to this question, right? It's a really popular question. But what I would say is the Sheiltos has the best answer. You know what happened? There was not even enough oil for a single day. Not even enough oil. afilu. I think that's really an interesting point. But let's just go back to the Sheiltos. The Sheiltos says that what is Ner Hanukkah? Why do we light the candles? And then the Sheiltos has the end of the Gemara. The conclusion of the Gemara is that they established the days for Halel and Hoda'ah. Lighting the candles is Halel and Hoda'ah. When I light the candles, the Sheiltos is not speaking about recitation of Halal and Shul. And he is not speaking about saying Al Hanisim in Davening. Zuck the Sheiltos, Halal and Hoda'a is fulfilled when I light the candles. That's a really interesting idea. Now, this idea is not my own although I think the discovery of the Sheotos might be my own. But this idea is suggested by the former chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, Rebbe Betzal Jolti. Rebbe Jolti was the chief rabbi in Yerushalayim, I believe, until the end of the 70s, at which point Rav Kulitz took over as Yerushalayim, as the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim. Then they had like 10 years when there's no chief rabbi of Yerushalayim. Now Rabbi Aryeh Stern is the chief rabbi. But if you... Rev. Jolti comments that it's entirely possible that Halel and Hodu'a is fulfilled when I light the candles. He tries to read this into the Rambam. The Rambam tells us the story of Hanukkah about how the Greeks made decrees against the Jews that we could not learn Torah. 
the text of the Rambam that we have says that the Greeks took our money and they took the daughters. Um, just another brief aside, Binotehem seems to be a much greater assault on the Jewish people. Taking the daughters is a greater assault than taking the money. So how come Binotehem comes after Memonam? So I saw last night that the Sefer Masa Rokeach on the Rambam writes that the original text, I didn't have a chance to look at the manuscripts, but the original text said, Bibatehem, not Bibnotam. Also it says Bibnotehem, which is like a funny term. It should be Bibnotam, not Bibnotehem. So the text really might be Bibatehem, that the Greeks, the Seleucid Greeks, took the money and they took their homes. And there are, there are a number of sources that say that one of the decrees of the Greeks was that there should be no private space. That the people were unable, the law said they could not close the door to their homes. Their homes had to be open to the public. And if that's the reason I saw an article by Rabbi Bleich a number of years ago, where Rabbi Bleich maintains that the reason why the home is so central to the mitzvah of Hanukkah is because the decree of Hanukkah was that we could have no private space. We could have no private space at all. The doors had to be open. We emphasize the home. We light candles at home because we're emphasizing that our private space is a place of Kedusha. So the Rambam tells us the entire story of the Greeks attack, attacking the Jews, how the Greeks defiled the Taharot, which would mean that when we find that cruise of oil, we are rebelling against the Greeks. They wanted to defile the oil. We found that one cruise of pure oil. And then the Rambam goes on, when they win the war, Halacha Beis, and they destroy them to the 25th day of Kislev, they find that one cruise of oil. We know the story. And then the Rambam writes, and because of that, the Chachomim in the generation established eight days of Hanukkah, which begin on the 25th day of Kislev. These are days of Simcha v'Halel, umadlikin bahen hanerot. These are days of joy and Halel, Joys and we know what halal is. You recite halal, umad likin bahen haneirot, and you light candles. So Rabbi Jolti is bothered by the question: How come the Rambam leaves hoda'a out? The Gemara says halal the hoda'a. Why does the Rambam leave hoda'a out? So Rabbi Jolti suggests that hoda'a is fulfilled by lighting the candles. The way I thank God in particular on Chanukah is I light the candles. Halel and Hoda'ah is the main point of Chanukah. What Hoda'ah means, whether Hoda'ah means that I thank Hashem when I dove and I say Al Hanisim, or whether Hoda'ah means that my lighting of the candles itself is a form of hoda'ah, which I'll elaborate on in a few minutes. But halel and hoda'ah is the core of Hanukkah. The lighting of candles, in particular, the lighting of candles in the Pirsume Nisa sort of way, the public demonstration of Hanukkah is not part of the original Hanukkah. Either because there was no Hadlokas HaMenorah in the original Hanukkah, because you don't have to when there's a Beis HaMikdash, or because the original Hanukkah had Madlik and Haneros as a form of Hoda'a rather than a form of Pirsume Nisa. Let me explain. Pirsume Nisa is known in society as the main element of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is described, um, what's his name has the whole Hanukkah song on Saturday Night Live, I forgot his name, um, but- Adam Sandler. 
Adam Sandler. Thank you very much. Right. So Adam Sandler has the whole Hanukkah song, and the idea of the Hanukkah song basically is that the yontiv of Hanukkah is to spread our values. Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with a harmonica originally, but the idea of Hanukkah is that we show, we demonstrate Jewish values to an otherwise value-starved world. That's what Hanukkah is about. Hanukkah is public. And that's the common idea of Hanukkah that's most widely expressed. It's a time of Jewish pride, Certainly since the advent of the state of Israel, Chanukah has been me yimbalel givurot Yisrael. Right? That's the Chanukah. But that's not the original Chanukah. The original Chanukah isn't about broadcasting our values. It's about conveying an internal sense of gratitude. Halel and Hoda'a is more core to Chanukah than Pursume Nisa. Chanukah is about feeling gratitude, praising Hashem for what happened. That's something that happens in me that's not out there. That's really the lesson of Chanukah. Now, what's the difference between Halel and Hoda'a? What are these terms? First of all, I should just note that if you read the Rambam carefully, um, the Rambam has Halel as part of Chanukah. Hoda'a in Al Hanisim for the Rambam is not part of Chanukah. The Rambam includes Al Hanisim as Hilchos Tfila. It's just part of davening. I say Yalav Yavon Rosh Chodesh. I say Al Hanisim on Chanukah. The Al Hanisim is not the core of the Yontif. And perhaps the idea is what we're saying because Hoda'a is fulfilled when I light the candles. Rav Jolti, in fact, goes so far and he says, then when I light the Chanukah candles, if I am not thinking that I am doing this in gratitude for Hashem's miracle of finding that cruise of oil and, constant, and consequently demonstrating that the victory over the Seleucid Greeks was miraculous, I don't fulfill the mitzvah. The mitzvah has to have hoda'a. The mitzvah has to be a demonstration of my personal internal appreciation. Lighting the candles without hoda'a is not the mitzvah of Hanukkah. That's what Rav Jolti suggests. My feeling is that's going a little bit far, but as we say in Yiddish, it's far-fetched. But at the same time, I think there is some value in emphasizing the hoda'a aspect of Hanukkah the idea that Chanukah is about demonstrating our own internal feeling of our internal feeling of gratitude. I'm happy that I was able to answer Sam Soroka's question. Sam asked, is there a specific kavona required by saying the bracha? The answer is yeah, there is. The kavona is hoda'a, a thought of gratitude, at least according to Rav Jolti. Now, what's the difference between halel and hoda'a? We have these two terms. They are most often thought of as being synonymous. Is there any difference between Halel and Hoda'a? So over Shabbos, I, I, I sort of developed a, an obsession with Rav Cook. And I, this is like part of my midlife crisis. And Rav Cook in his Siddur Olatri Iya, where he describes the Yontiv of Hanukkah. So he talks about Halel and Hoda'a. What's the difference? Says Rav Kook, Halel is very general. I say the same Halel on Pesach, on Shavuos, on Sukkot, on Hanukkah, on Rosh Chodesh. It's the same Prakim and Tehillim. It's the same thing. That's Halel. Halel is a general expression of how Hashem improves the Jewish people and consequently improves the world by having the Jews overcome specific obstacles. Halel is general gratitude. Hoda'a, however, is very specific. 
If I say thank you, and I say thank you for everything, that is virtually meaningless. But when you write a thank you card that says, you know what, you did this, and it made me really feel good. When you're really specific, that's hoda'a. So the hoda'a, at least in the sense of hoda'a that we have according to Rashi and the Al Hanisim, we spell out exactly what happened. We spell it all out because hoda'a means recognition and appreciation of every detail. Halel is general, hoda'a is specific. And I think this idea is expressed beautifully in the Gemara in Brachas. You know, there are times when in Eretz Yisrael there is rain. Or excuse me, there are times in Eretz Yisrael where there is a drought, there's no rain. And finally, when that first rain comes, it's a time of tremendous simcha. It's a time of tremendous joy when the, um, when the rain comes. Right, we, right, Harvey Berman notes that we also say as part of the Moden prayer, exactly. The Moden prayer is that we are thanking God, but I'd say in a very specific way, right, that we're thanking God specifically for our own life, etc. I don't, I think Modim in particular emphasizes specific thanks rather than just thank you in a general way. So there's a time in Israel when there's a drought. And when there's a drought, and finally, there's rain after the drought, you recite the bracha tova metiv. So the Gemara says, but one second, the bracha that's recited is only mishayetze chatan lekrat kala. That means, exactly, right? Mishayetze chatan lekrat kala means that there's already rain on the ground and the new rain comes and it touches that rain which is already on the ground, then we recite the bracha. And what is the bracha that we recite? My mevarchim. What bracha do you recite when the rain comes? Zak li gemara, amarav Yehuda, modim anachnu lach, akotipa vitipa shehorata lanu. We don't thank Hashem in general. We thank Hashem specifically all the details. All the details um, for every single drop of rain is worthy of thanks. Akotipa v'tipa shehorad talanu. It's very specific. So Chanukah is about Halel and it's about Hoda'a. That's the real yontif. The lighting of the candles, at least in the sense of the Pursume Nisa, at least in the sense of broadcasting our values, I think that's secondary. The main point of Hanukkah is the appreciation of the appreciation that we have internally for what happened. Both the general appreciation in terms of what Klau Yisrael has accomplished and also more specifically, the appreciation for the miracles of Hanukkah. I think this year when it's been quite tough I think we should at Hanukkah time start to think more specifically about what there is to appreciate. If when rain comes, we're appreciative of every single drop, that means even the small things require our appreciation. This year when so much has been difficult, I think it forces us to really focus on the specifics that we appreciate those specifics have to really be um, emphasized in our understanding of Hanukkah. Again, these are some of my um, thoughts regarding the Yantiv of Hanukkah. And of course, I thank you for coming and for listening. I, um, I really appreciate all of your time and I was asked to try to share the source sheet um, 
And I think I did it. I think we have, oh. no, not the whole thing. Well, if it, if it gets complicated, Rebbe could always email it to me and I'd yeah, be happy I, I, to I'm May not ask the question, much Rabbi. a savvy person, so I will share the source sheet um, with Rabbi Kurtz, and Rabbi Kurtz will um, share it with all of you. Um, thank you. May for, I ask a question, uh, Rabbi? May I ask you a question, please? Yeah, please. My name is David Basalali. Uh, how could Rashi not know about the Hanukkah menorah as we recognize it today, as we know it today, when we have got Bechama, Betilal, they argue as to which way do you light the Hanukkah candles begin from, you go, we start from one to eight or from eight to one and all that back and forth. So how could Rashi at his time already hundreds of years past the Chamay, Betilal arguments not have known about this? So I think that's a good question. Obviously Rashi knew about it. Rashi knew about lighting the Hanukkah menorah. But I think the point that Rashi is stressing is that the original Hanukkah was not about the menorah. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel is coming later at that original Hanukkah. So we were not aware, or it didn't exist. Lighting the menorah did not exist at that original Hanukkah. I think that's the point that Rashi is stressing. Of course, Rashi knew about it. Rashi is the most important 25 minutes in Jewish history, no? 1040 until 1105. Rashi knows exactly about um, the, lighting the Hanukkah candles, but Rashi feels that he does not have to mention it precisely because it wasn't done at that time. Thank you. Okay. I, I think uh, an important point, um, I think we discussed this in an Earl, uh, a year a couple years ago in Stanford, the translation of the words Lashana Acheres is slightly imprecise as next year because it's not necessarily translated as next year. It means some other year. Right. Um, I, I, so it's I not entirely clear when that, that tradition started. Yeah, so I, I don't know when it started. I really, um, I'm not aware of when it was. Um, what I could say is that it was at some point after that original um, Hanukkah. So the original Hanukkah was, the original Hanukkah, there is no lighting of the menorah. I think that, I would like to argue that that's correct. Um, Later on, at some undisclosed time, Lashana Acheret, so they made it Halel and Hoda'a. Perhaps it's the next year. The first year, they're just happy that there is a victory. The next year, they say, this is worthy of a yuntiv. And then, and then at some later time, then they say, you know what? We're going to even institute the Hadlakat HaMenorah. That's the basic idea that I want to um, get at. Thank you. I just want to be uh, sensitive to Rabbi Schwartz's time. We'll take one more question from Toby Schaefer, who's patiently virtually raising her hand over there, and then we'll conclude. Thank you. Rabbi, earlier in this year, you were speaking about um, not benefiting from the candles, not to, you know, any kind of mitzvah benefits. But if all of this sort of is deriving from the, the temple. I mean, certainly once the menorah was lit in the temple, there were mitzvahs that continued in front of it, weren't there? I mean, there were, there, whatever was done in the temple was considered mitzvah, wasn't it? So, yeah, you're 100% right. Whatever was done in the temple was considered mitzvah, but those activities could have been done without the menorah. The menorah in the temple did not provide necessary illumination. The menorah in the temple um, was, the Gemara in fact says, v'chila ora hutzarech, does the Rebona Shlodel need the light? The light wasn't necessary. They had a mizbeach, they had, they had light for, you didn't, all the avod and the Beis HaMeklash is done during the daytime. The so light of the menorah was unnecessary. I'm, so would we derive from that today that if you, 
have other lights on where the menorah is lit that you could sit and learn there or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when there's other lights on, you can sit and learn there. In fact, according to many, the reason for the shamish is so that I am not deriving benefit from the actual Hanukkah candles. My benefit is coming from that one non-Hanukkah candle. Right? You make a mistake when you buy the pack of Hanukkah candles and they have eight shamises there. Right? The, the shamis is not really a Hanukkah candle. It's a non-Hanukkah candle in order to enable us to derive benefit, um, to derive benefit from those lights. Thank okay. you. Thank you very Once much, Rebbe, because... for your time. It was uh, a huge privilege. Uh, was there something else you wanted to say? No, I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> uh, I think Hoda'a is core of Hanukkah. So thank you to Rabbi Kurtz, to Rabbi Cohen, to the Stanford thank community. You. And you should have a wonderful Hanukkah. I will share the source sheet with you in two minutes. Okay, thank you. And I'll just share. Thank you, Rebbe. Huge schluss to have you. Have a wonderful Hanukkah. And thank you, Amen. everyone, for spending uh, you, <laughs> Sunday morning. Here. Elisheva has the Hanukkah sweatshirt that we put together. Oh. Elisheva oh, put I was in her shear, yeah. and we were learning um, Hanukkah. I'm really happy. Um, I think my sweatshirt, my daughter took to Israel. She's in Israel this year. Um, so I don't have it or else I would have, <laughs> had I thought of it, I would have brought it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. It's great to see you, Elisheva, Dina. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you in Stanford. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.